Hi, this is Adam from CNYC, and today we will be covering the topic of racism. Um, with the current political climate and how this past year, 2020, has played out, uh, I think this is a very pertinent topic to see how um, it plays into our spirituality as Christians and what exactly the Bible has to say. Now, many people from across the board um, have stated that the Bible promotes slavery. What we'll be doing in this um, in today's recording is seeing if that's actually true. What exactly does the Bible state about slavery? Now, the word slave in the Bible comes from the word abed. This is from the Old Testament, abed, which means servant. So it's not so much a slave as it is a servant. This is important to understand because the difference between slavery in the Bible as opposed to slavery in pre-antebellum civil war slavery is that people sold themselves voluntarily in the Bible. Uh, this was completely out of their own free will. This could be seen in Leviticus chapter 25, verse 39. It says the following, And if one of your brethren who dwells by you becomes poor and sells himself to you, you shall not compel him to serve as a slave. Uh, as a hired servant and a sojourner, he shall be with you and shall serve with you the year of Jubilee. So people sold themselves into slavery to avoid poverty. Um, you see this as well um, with the Jews who sold themselves to avoid famine. Uh, they did this to Joseph uh, in the book of Genesis. It even says that in Leviticus 25, 42. <clears throat> For they are my servants whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. They shall not be sold as slaves. So that's the difference between um, slavery prescribed by God uh, as opposed to slavery which played out in pre-Civil War America. Next point why biblical slavery or servanthood is different to that of the pre-Civil War era is because slaves or servants were only to be served or to operate within a six-year period. This wasn't a lifelong thing. If we see in Exodus chapter 21, starting verses 1 to 2, and this is God himself speaking, now these are the judgments which you shall set before them. If you buy a Hebrew servant, he shall serve six years. And in the seventh, he shall go out free and pay nothing. So, again, the difference between the biblical servanthood compared to the pre-antebellum Civil War era slavery in America is that it was prescribed for a limited amount of time. Now, if a person uh, in the biblical era wanted to serve as a servant or a slave uh, indefinitely, it says in Exodus 21, verses 5 to 6, but if the servant plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will, know, I will not go out free. So you could see automatically that the person has a choice whether to stay past the prescribed six-year period um, or to stay with the master forever. He shall also, then his master shall bring him to the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or to the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. So again, that's the aspect of choice. Uh, no one's being forced to do anything here, um, as opposed to the pre-Civil War slavery in America. Um, people were stripped from their homes, from their homeland, and forced to uh, be a slave in a foreign land. All right, now concerning um, another aspect of why biblical slavery or servanthood was different to the slavery in pre-Civil War America is because, according to God himself in the Bible, he prohibits the kidnapping of a person. It says in Exodus 21, verse 16, He who kidnaps a man and sells him 
or if he is found in his hand, shall surely be put to death. The reason for that is because we see this in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, that man is made in the image of God. We are to respect and love one another um, through that understanding in order to kidnap someone and force him into something that they don't want to do is cruel, unusual, and is not walking in the love that God prescribes us to do. Yet another reason why pre-Civil War slavery is different to that of the Bible, it says in Exodus 21 verse 20, And if a man beats his male or female servant with a rod, so that he dies under his hand, he shall surely be punished. Uh, we don't see that happen in pre-Civil War slavery, where um, slaves were unfortunately being murdered and, and being brutally mistreated. Um, they were seen almost as cattle. They were uh, of low value, not in the image of God, as God prescribes them to be seen through in Exodus 21 and other parts of the Bible. Yet another example of how slaves in the Bible had rights compared to those in pre-Civil War era. Exodus 21, verses 26 to 27, reads the following. If a man strikes the eye of his male or female servant and destroys it, he shall let him go free for the sake of his eye. And if he knocks out the tooth of his male or female servant, he shall let him go free for the sake of his tooth. So again, and we see this in verses 24 to 25 here. Actually, verses 23, verses uh, 23 to 25 says, But if any harm follows, then he shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. This is something so completely radically different than the slavery that is seen in pre Civil War America, where a servant has rights. If they were mistreated, they could walk away and end the mutual agreement that both the servant and the master had between themselves. Much like how an employee, they have certain rights while being part of the company. They're given certain benefits um, and the like. However, if either, if the servant or the employee feels that they're being mistreated, they had every right to walk away, so long as it, of course, could be verified. An interesting thing about biblical slavery as opposed to pre-Civil War slavery, if we go to Deuteronomy chapter 15, starting in verse 12, it states the following, something very interesting. If your brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, is sold to you and serves you six years, again, that's a prescribed limit for slavery or servanthood in the Bible. It's not lifelong. Unless the servant himself wishes uh, for it to be that way. Then in the seventh year, you shall let him go free from you. And when you send him away free from you, you shall not let him go empty handed. Very interesting. Verse 14, you shall supply him liberally, generously from your flock from your threshing floor with wheat, and from your wine press, from what the Lord your God has blessed you with, you shall give to him. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore I command you this thing today. And if it happens that he says to you, I will not go away from you, because he loves you and your house, since he prospers with you, Again, a servant or a slave in the Bible, they prospered along with the master. If the master is doing well, then the slave, the slave or the servant is also doing well. It's a mutual, beneficial relationship. Nothing compared to what we see uh, in pre-Civil War era. Another thing, too, uh, before we continue, notice how it says in verse 12, if you're a brother, you know, Caucasians and priests of war America did not see Africans as their brothers and sisters. They saw them as, again, like cattle, animals, uh, subhuman. So uh, there's a sense of compassion due to being um, both being created by God in the Bible, 
which is completely devoid of what we see historically in pre-Civil War uh, slavery in America. All right, now we read verse 16, we're on verse 17 of Deuteronomy 15. So Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 17. Then he shall take an awl and thrust it through his ear to the door, and he shall be your servant forever. Also to your female servant you shall do likewise. It shall not seem hard to you when you send him away free from you, for he has been worth a doubled hired servant in serving you six years. Then the Lord your God will bless you in all that you do. So again, a person or a slave or a servant, when they completed their contractual agreement of six years, God obliges, he requires it of the master to let them go not empty-handed, to give them food, to give them livestock, to give them enough provision for them to start a new life. This is something completely void in Civil War, pre-Civil War America. We see, uh, unfortunately, slaves trying to escape, um, crossing several states just to get to the north. Um, and they had to start a new life from scratch or from absolutely nothing. Now, interestingly enough, uh, we see historically that there was a piece of literature that was encouraged um, during and around this time where uh, slaves were, you could say, enforced to believe that their current lot in life was um, acceptable. Uh, and this was not so much in America as it was in the Caribbean islands, such as Jamaica, Barbados, and Antigua. And what I'm talking about here is the Slave Bible. Now, the Slave Bible, uh, actually called, and I quote, parts of the Holy Bible selected for the use of the Negro slaves in the British West India Islands. Uh, it was published in 1807, which was three years after the Haitian Revolution ended. Um, the interesting thing enough about the Haitian Revolution, it was one of the only slave riot revolts in history in which the enslaved people successfully drove out their Euro European oppressors and formed the new nation. Uh, because of this, both American and European paranoia uh, began to creep up, and they published this slave Bible in 1807. Now, what makes this different to the actual Bible is the fact that most of the Old Testament is missing, and only about half of the New Testament remains. Now, what these people did, that they butchered the scriptures, and they butchered it in a way so that they included Joseph's tale of enslavement in Egypt found in the book of Genesis, but they excluded the parts of the Bible, such as Moses letting the Jews out of slavery to freedom. Um, they would use this Bible in sermons, um, and they would aim it at these enslaved individuals in order to portray Joseph as uh, almost like a role model, someone who accepted their lot in life at that particular time and, and was a quote-unquote good slave. Another important passage in Scripture that was excised um, is Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. And it says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond or slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. You see, the thing about Jesus, God, is that he doesn't look at the outward appearance. Right? He doesn't care what you look like on the outside. He cares about your heart on the inside. And God is a spirit. It says that in John chapter 4, verse 24. And it says, those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now we see in 1 Samuel 16, 7, it states the following. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, right? At the skin color, at how tall the person is, how, 
you know, um, the muscles, the breasts, you know, all that type, the, the, the figure, things like that. Man looks one way, but God doesn't look the way as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. That's what matters. It's the heart that matters. Because at the end of the day, flesh, as we see in Genesis, it's made up of dust. God said that to Adam after he transgressed. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. There's many different colors of dirt, um, and there's many different colors of skin. Right? But we see in Numbers chapter 27, verse 16, states the following. Let the Lord... The God of the spirits of all flesh set a man over the congregation. Something that's very interesting in the Bible is that God does not prescribe slavery based on a particular um, skin color, a particular demographic, nationality, um, gender, what have you. It's based on financial circumstance. It's not based on, and it's mutual. It's voluntarily. It's not forced. Something completely different from what we see throughout history. And the reason for that is because these people who have enacted slavery, as we have historically seen, do that not in the confines of the Bible, um, as the way God prescribed it in the law, um, but they do that to their own destructive means by twisting the scripture, by butchering the Bible, and... and misquoting it, taking it out of context, and uh, propagating their agenda that way. Now, a question you may ask is, well, does God still favor slavery? Does he allow it according to how it's written in the Old Testament? The answer is no. It says very clearly in the scripture that Jesus is the end of the law. Right? Jesus Christ is the end of the law. I'm going to get that verse right now. Romans chapter 10, verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. So, when Christ died on the cross, the law of Moses was taken out of the way. It says that in Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. The law was done. The law was no more. It was taken out of the way. So, when the law was taken out of the way, all those ordinances, all those laws... Uh, such as dietary laws, you can't eat this, you can't eat that. Uh, those uh, laws that we read in, in Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy, all those were wiped away. They were gone. Um, again, God allowed these things to play out, but it wasn't ultimately his will. There's a divine will and there's a permissive will. Just because God allows something to do doesn't mean that's what he wants to do. So again, uh, those who try to divide themselves based on gender and nationality, they're sensual. They, they focus on the flesh uh, and they have no spiritual understanding. Um, they are blind. It says that in Jude chapter 1. There's only one chapter of Jude, but Jude chapter 1 verses 17 to 19. But beloved, remember the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 18. How they told you that there would be mockers in the last time, or the last days, which we are now, who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the spirit. Those people who cause divisions based on the flesh, uh, again, you know, Black versus white, you know, Asian versus what have you, uh, male versus female, you know, the gender wars. Uh, they're ultimately sensual. Um, they cause divisions and they're going after ungodly lusts. Unfortunately, many of these people have been programmed to think that way based on the media, what's in TV, etc. Uh, but I tell you this, that God doesn't look at you that way. He looks after your heart to see if you're a good person and if you ultimately believe in him. Um that's the metric in which God measures you. If you are if you look like Christ, if you look like the heart of Christ, the mind of Christ, not on how he physically looked. So that's what I challenge you today. I challenge you to look over these scriptures that we spoke about um, and really review, again, the huge stark differences that pre-Civil War slavery had compared to what the Bible has. We've clearly proven 
that biblical slavery or servanthood is a 180 degree difference to that uh, seen in pre-Civil War America. The, the difference can be measured between East and West. As far as the East is from the West, so far is uh, those types of slavery. Um, so again, I encourage you to look at these scriptures. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, I encourage you to write them in the comment section below. And thank you so much for listening.